This is the RV Advisor Podcast with your host, Tom Alexander. Get all the latest information, trends, advice from experts, stories from the road, and more in the world of recreational vehicles. Now, here's Tom. Welcome to the RV Advisor Podcast. My name is Tom Alexander, and joining me today from Hope on Wheels, it is David Strahan. David, welcome. Good morning, sir. It is uh, great to have you, and uh, we really appreciate your time and joining us. I know this is a, uh, a, a would most likely be a very busy time for you, and of course now with world events going on, I'm sure it's uh, just spiraling uh, in a million different directions. So first of all, let's learn a little bit about Hope on Wheels. What is the mission of Hope on Wheels? So Hope on Wheels' mission started after a family death in Iraq um, when I saw RVs being sold at auction, you know, needing minimal repairs that could be used to house, um, at the time, needy veterans, which is now expand to veterans, families, families with disabilities, and others. Mm -hmm. And and so you, uh, now that folks could obviously use help, shelter, um any other kinds of support, uh, you're there with, with RVs and and other things. My outreach initially started, um, I do a lot of river cleanups, and so I interact directly with a lot of the homeless living along the river. Yeah. And I was seeing a need for sanitation along these rural campsites because um, I couldn't fathom uh, what was being dumped in our waterways. One of my first projects was a portable toilet on wheels with a hand wash station that was taken to a sensitive wetlands area for a large encampment there. Mm -hmm. And expanding upon that, doing storage auctions, I saw these RVs being sold for cheap in a point in time when our wounded soldiers were coming home, oftentimes released to the streets with no housing options. And this was an easy way to solve that that uh, problem that was so near and dear to our hearts. Yeah. Um, you're in the Eugene, Oregon area. Uh, tell us a little bit about the homelessness there. Is it uh, is it a pretty rampant situation? Um, Eugene Springfield is along the I-5 corridor, so we have a very significant number of homeless here. I've been taking part in the annual point in time count for several years now, and so I'm, I know directly what those numbers are. And as a shelter worker, I'm also very close to the residents here in Springfield and have a good idea of what their needs are, yeah. of how they became, many of how they became homeless, and oftentimes how difficult the steps are to transition from the street into some form of housing back into apartment or home life. You know, unfortunately, there's a stigma with uh, homelessness, and, and um, you know, I've seen it directly myself uh, i'm a musician as well and i do a lot of shows uh sometimes volunteer shows and i'll go into certain areas of the city and uh, a block away from where i might be playing are large groups of homeless people and every now and then you know you get strike up a conversation and you know these a lot of these folks are people who had jobs had homes and um, one thing led to another, and, and, and uh, they found themselves in this unfortunate situation. Uh, you know, we watch movies from the 30s and 40s, and, you know, the word then was bum or hobo, right? And, yes. and, and it was, it was uh, almost presented in a, in, in a comical way. It's the last thing in the world that is is comical. Um, it's, it's an entirely different thing, and I think the sense of homelessness. I think people are starting to come around and understand it a little better, but there's a long way to go, isn't there? It is indeed. And, and thankfully so, that tide has slowly started to turn around where people are realizing that that person they see flying a sign on a corner or asking for help may not necessarily have a drug addiction or may not have uh, mental health issues, but often after a period of time on the year uh, of years on the street, those develop. It's part of a coping mechanism. Yeah. Not not every homeless is a drug addict or needy. In fact, many of the homeless I work with have small part-time jobs, but there's no way for them to save enough living on the street to get back into housing. In yeah. addition, those that do um, acquire addiction issues 
there's no in-house treatment for them on the street. And honestly, getting clean and sober while you're living on the street is next to impossible. I, you know, want to find out a little bit more about what you do, especially in in regards to the RVs in and fixing them up and making them available. So we're going to take a quick break. I'm talking with David Strahan with Hope on Wheels. We'll be back right after these words. During this time of crisis with the coronavirus pandemic, it's important to help take care of those who are taking care of us, our first responders and healthcare professionals. They're on the front lines fighting this virus, and we need to be there for them. Consider providing your RV for them to stay in while out in the field, a place to retreat and relax while taking care of the sick. You can help in one of two ways. Go to rvaca.org and fill out the form to donate your RV temporarily. Or click on the donation page to help with covering the costs of getting RVs to their destinations. These first responders and healthcare providers are giving many hours a day to the fight against COVID-19 and should not be out of pocket while stationed away from home. RVACA.org is a 501c3, so your donation of your RV or financial gifts are tax deductible. Please, now is the time for America to unite in the fight, because together we can win. Visit rvaca.org today. We are back on the RV Advisor podcast. My name is Tom Alexander, and I am speaking to David Strahan from Hope on Wheels. And uh, while we were away there for just a second, David, you were starting to tell me about uh, something uh, that you're working on currently. Yeah, a lot of these RVs pick up names uh, throughout their restoration process because of things that happen in their history, of how they're donated, of who they're donated to. Uh, One was called the Golden Ticket because it got repainted in black and gold to look new enough to go into an RV park. Mm. The most recent one I delivered was named the Full Circle because it completed multiple full circles in multiple worlds. Uh, One in the veterans world, it was donated from a veteran who tragically died in the Willamette River. Uh, it came to a fallen soldier's house, ours, and was donated to a disabled soldier in the nearby town of Monroe, uh, completing a three-veteran full circle. That RV will hopefully, uh, once Charlie, the recipient, is housed, will come back to me to go back in again and complete another circle for somebody else. I see. And you yourself, are you um, instrumental in actually the restorations uh, are you, are you handy? <laughs> <laughs> I am the chief cook and bottle washer at this entire organization called Hope on Wheels. Gotcha. The work is done in front of my home. Um, I've got a friend with some property in Eugene where I store a couple of these that are being used by his homeless employees. Right. Um, my portable bathroom is there to use for those folks. But all the work takes place here at my home um, with some very forgiving neighbors, I must add. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, sure. I would imagine that. Uh, oh, here comes another one, right? It's uh, it's a, another one he's working on, and it's uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So some folks might be a little bit uh, frustrated, maybe with with having see seeing that all the time. But that's great that your neighbors are supportive and uh, in your corner. That's terrific. I do I do fall under the auspices of of the law every once in a while. I I have had one of my units green tagged at the curb because. Often these come with expired tags, no license, and I have to go through that process for oh, the owners. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they cannot be on the street, which is, you know, the only area I really have to work on, you know, anything more than 15 feet. I so, see. So uh, I have to be really careful with them, and uh, I take really good care of my neighbors uh, so that they continue to be forgiving of my uh, overlapping onto their property sometimes. Yeah. Um, but I can generally do anywhere from three to five three to eight RVs a year, depending on what condition they come in. Yeah. And I do my own fundraising also. Yeah. T- talk about the fundraising. I mean, that you know, I would imagine that's got to be a challenge. I try to keep my units to $1,000 and below that I can just give out without any, any hope, hope of recompense. Um, above that level, I would hope that maybe one of their friends would run a GoFundMe to help cover some of the title transfer fees that I incur on, on every one of these. It's over $300 just in title and transfer fees. Yeah. Or the 
cost of new tanks, the cost of new batteries, because all those things are always outdated when I get them. Right. Um, I do have people occasionally donate carpet and tiles and things like that, but that leads into storage issues. So I have some occasional small funders that, that put $100 in my, in my nonprofit account once in a while. But also, once a year or twice a year, I will buy a completely totaled RV at insurance auction, mm -hmm. um, a higher-end RV, mm -hmm. restore it and market it, and use all of that money to buy more RVs. That's my fundraising. Ah, I see. I see. You know, so my that... fundraising is my own labor. Right. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting you say that about uh, selling those higher-end RVs to make enough money to... Uh, continue to provide the the uh, smaller RVs and the older RVs to to the people who need them. It reminds me of the story about the artistic director in a, in movies who wants to make small art films and tell his own stories, but has to star in multi million dollar films to make the budget because <laughs> the studios yeah. won't support support his art films. You know, we've heard that story multiple times. And so that's kind of what it sounds like. That's what you're doing in in another in another sense. Um, Pretty much, I, yeah. I custom build them. Yeah. Um, the last one I did was for Whitebird Medical Team. Yeah. Um, and it was a 2003 with a tip out, so that one was converted into a mobile medical office. Mm -hmm. The whole front room was was covered in durable, washable materials, um, high high uh, waste coating, solid floors. Right. And that is a that's a mobile medical. Uh, office that's going to be taken to remote sites to help with homeless outreach. I see. We're speaking with David Strahan. He's from Hope on Wheels, based uh, near Eugene, Oregon, providing shelter uh, with RVs to homeless people and, and people in need. David, with the COVID-19, the coronavirus world crisis going on right now, seems no place on the globe is, un, you know, not untouched. It's <laughs> it's it's unbelievable. Um it you know what have you seen in, in, in during this stretch during this time and 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 the uh, the need perhaps the increased need for for what you do? Can you share a little bit about that? Certainly, we're we're living in a Stephen King era of, of pandemic that people are pretty afraid of, and there's a lot of false information. Yeah, a lot of the people that I work with, I, I work specifically with over a hundred guests in Springfield. We know their medical needs. We know what what condition their health is in. And we also know that sometimes putting these people into large shelters isn't the best option for some of it. For those people, individual shelter-in-place RVs, particularly the smaller bumper poles, are critical to their life success, really. Yeah. Um, I've been asked to provide 50 units by a Lane, person working with Lane County here. There's, there's no way I can come up with 50 units. And those were directly geared for homeless and those who have the need to isolate. Hmm. Um, without it, we could easily see a pandemic within some of these small homeless communities because they have no no health services. Right. Yeah. By providing several of these small units in isolated uh, campsites, we're able to keep those people isolated, keep them in their own semi form of of, uh, of housing. But that also takes resources and backup. That takes people delivering clean water to them, hauling out their sewage, bringing propane tanks, uh, providing power somehow. So there's there's some resources that need to happen along with those encampments. And up until this epidemic, city governments have been hesitant to support any of these campsites. I think our local governments are starting to realize that these small encampments may be critical to isolating this virus within the homeless population. And hopefully our, our government will see forward on that and support some of these things. Right now, they expect the citizen volunteers to go spend their money to, to help solve these problems with a potential promise of 75% payback. Yeah. What needs to happen is this money needs to be up front. And said, here's a card, here's an account. We want you to provide this service, this service, and this service to these three, four, five, and ten. Can you do that within this budget? Right. And that's what needs to happen. Can you um, let folks know, please, where they can go to learn more, not only learn more about this and what you do, but also perhaps even uh, lend a hand? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it right from the top because you're a, you're a nationwide broadcast. 
I do my banking at Oregon Community Credit Union. My name is David W. Strahan. My account is in trust of Hope on Wheels. So anybody online can go to Oregon Community Credit Union, find Hope on Wheels and David Strahan, and make a direct deposit there. If they know of people in the uh, West, e- West Eugene, Willamette Valley area that have small RVs that are not being used, I have an immediate need right now for as many of these units as I can get. I require my recipient clients to have a legal place to put them so they don't get towed once they're on the street. We've been given a waiver from the government, from our local governor temporarily, to move these RVs without current tags and title issues. So it opens up the door right now to get some of these out of people's side yards and out of storage lots and put people in them living right now. Um, So, again, that's Oregon Community Credit Union, David Strahan, in trust of Hope on Wheels. Or you can find me on Facebook. My Facebook page, Hope on Wheels, is wide open, and I encourage people to direct questions there or to direct message me from that side also. Great. So on Facebook at Hope, Hope on Wheels. That's uh, that's terrific. David, we really do, not only do we appreciate your time today, but uh, most certainly we appreciate the good work that you're doing, continued success. Thank you, and uh, hopefully we can get you back on the show sometime in the near future. I, I really encourage people that if there's some way I could share the thrill of handing somebody a set of keys to a home, if I could share that with anybody they would instantly be attached to this. That thrill of solving somebody's housing situation, that joy that I get is phenomenal. It can't be touched. I'm sure. I I can only imagine and uh, continued success with, with all your great work. Thank you very much. This is the RV Advisor Podcast. I'm Tom Alexander. We'll catch you next time. Thank you so much for listening. So long, everybody. You've been listening to the RV Advisor Podcast with Tom Alexander. This podcast is produced in association with Studio Alpha and Alexander Productions in Miami. Visit thervadvisor.com for more.